employees who were vying for the same position you were applying for? Is that it? That's correct. Okay, so who are you suing? The company that permitted this to, ha to happen? Yes, I am. Well, how, here's what I want to know. Let's say you were assaulted. Let's say you were violated, which is horrible. I still don't understand why it's the responsibility of the company. Did they say to the people, go ahead and spit on Susan? No, I went to them, and they did nothing about it, and then I went to the police. And uh, the police, and I have filed a complaint with the police. And my my uh, employers were also foreign, and uh, they are of the opinion they hire their own people. And All right, so I don't know, I without think, going into the case, it says you sued your own lawyer. I thought your lawyer and you were suing the company for $100 million. To mislead you. My, I'm involved in a nine-year-old case that is $100,000, and that's how it was publicized, and that's how it was written up. And I'm suing my former employer for this because uh, the harassment and abuse that well, I... You said that already, but it says on the board you sued your lawyer. Is that true? No. I didn't sue my oh, okay. lawyer. Oh, so the call screener got it wrong. Pardon me. My, my case is nine years old and he has done not, absolutely nothing. All right, so what's the bottom line? What should we take away? Most people are ready to turn the dial and go listen to uh, uh, music now. What, what do you want to tell the world? The thing is, I had to take my lawyer after nine years to the disciplinary committee, and it's a year and a half for the disciplinary no, Now you're saying you are suing your lawyer. All right, what? Susan, thanks for the call. You know, Creedmoor is closed a long time out on Long Island. The, the, the boards are in the windows. There's a very good uh, argument to be made to open the, reopen the mental hospitals. We could clear off the court dockets. First start with the uh, judges. If you randomly took 50% of those in black robes and, and put them in mental hospitals, that would clear up the dockets pretty quick. Then you have a lot of space left in the mental hospitals that are reopened. Randomly pick 50% of the tort lawyers in America and lock them up. Fill the mental hospitals, put them where they belong, let them argue with each other, and then clear up the courtrooms. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7287-SAVAGE. Play it, play it, play it. Play the actual song. More interesting than the Play get foot and you can, you can get a hot foot. I don't understand people don't understand anything. I say play a song, they play the opening. Get to the part where it's staying a lot, something hot. All right, whatever. I'm not, I'm not a disco player. Let's have some disco music that actually sounds like dance music on the Savage Nation during the next break. But I want to give everyone listening to the show some legal advice. After, after many a year... After Many a Summer Dies, the Swan was written a long time ago by Aldous Huxley. Great, great short story or novel. I remember reading it as a kid along a long line of reading Chrome Yellow. I read everything Huxley wrote, but I didn't learn very much. Here's the problem with intellectuals. They're wonderful to read. <clears throat> they're wonderful to watch on the screen, but they don't know much about life. Very little is known. They can't teach you anything. I learned more from a plumber than I did from Aldous Huxley. I'll be honest with you. I lear learned more from a welder than I did from Bertrand Russell. I learned more from a carpenter that I knew than I did from certainly Jack Kerouac, who I learned nothing from. I enjoyed reading him. I mean, I'd read these books, and I think I was gleaning some magical you know, knowledge about the universe and how to lead my life. No, they didn't know very much. I read everything Hemingway wrote. The poor guy shot his brains out with a shotgun. I didn't, thank God, take too much of his vice to heart. I mean, he had deep emotional problems, and of course there was a genetic tendency towards depression and suicide, which is no laughing matter. That's a, a really tough one to overcome. And then the final straw was when Hemingway went to the Mayo Clinic and they gave him shock therapy, and he came out of there and tried to walk into a propeller of a waiting plane because he couldn't think anymore and therefore he didn't want to live anymore. I mean, there are a lot of reasons that he put the shotgun to his mouth, but I didn't learn anything from Hemingway that I really took forward with me in life. Everything I have learned in my life I learned from the School of Hard Knocks because I'm a dreamer. I'm an idealist. My head's in the clouds. And let me tell you something. If you walk around with your head in the clouds, you're going to wind up missing a curb and getting hit by a bus. So at some point, you have to watch out for the buses turning the corner. 
Unfortunately, in San Francisco, they don't know that. They think that the world revolves around them. You look at the bicyclists, you look at the walkers, you look at the morons who go on the subways with their pants off yesterday like idiots. The world is on fire. Islam is taking over the globe. And these morons are going on subways without pants like it's a joke, like it's all a game. So everything I've learned, I've learned from pure observation and living. And one of the things I want to tell you is avoid arbitration at all costs. <laughs> I know you didn't know where I was coming from or where I was going. I'm just telling you, look, I won in the Supreme Court yesterday, and I didn't even take it to the Supreme Court. My antagonist took it to the Supreme Court because he wanted to avoid paying me in my estimation. So he figured he'd keep appealing and appealing and appealing. Well, eventually an appeal has to come to an end. Now, the trick is now find the money. That's another thing I want to tell you. Don't ever think you're going to win and, and collect. That's something anyone in business will tell you. There's one thing between winning... And there's another thing in winning and collecting. Two different worlds. And again, the lawyers and judges don't care whether you collect. They care about whether they have a job or not. Moving the interview with Mike Levine up by half an hour, the, the uh, undercover agent extraordinaire. And he'll be with us at the top of the next hour because the court's horror stories that I have on the board are so alarming and interesting that I don't care if you're worth a billion dollars or you're in a prison, you're going to want to hear them. WFTL Mark from Fort Lauderdale. Go ahead. What's your story? Yes, how you doing? Um, my story is my first encounter with the court system. And, I, and first of all, I couldn't agree with you more about the way the lawyers throw things out. Um, I was actually a lawyer at the time, and I had a tenant who basically wanted to rip me off for rent. And I took him to court, and I went to court, went before the judge. He wasn't really ready, so we had to come back. So I had to take another day off of work. So I did. Came back like two weeks later. This time, the judge treated me like I was the worst person in the world. But I still won the case. And ended up collecting zero from the tenant. So, I mean, it, even though that I did win, it, I, like, absolutely what you said before, I well, collected the zero. Tenant, oh, let me see. The tenant owed you back rent, I assume? Bingo. Right. All right, so you sued him for the back rent, you won, and then he took a walk, and you never found him, right? Well, it's actually, it's funny, because years later, I did see him, and he didn't recognize me, but I recognized him. I actually sat next to him in a dinner. It was interesting. And uh, and what, you gave him some polonium sushi as a, as a gift? No, actually, uh, believe it or not, I just told him, I said, you know what, I forgive you, and I walked away, and later on, he came up to me and said, this is what you're talking about, and I explained to him. Well, listen, that's why the movie The Godfather was so big in the 1970s because everyone listening to this show wished that they knew a godfather to seek justice because they know that they can't find justice in the courts do you remember the theme of the godfather about a, a little undertaker whose daughter had been molested by boys who got her drunk and on the daughter on, the, on the, the day of godfather's daughter's wedding he has to see people and answer their favors and the undertaker says to him these american boys they got my daughter drunk they gave her whiskey they took advantage of her. So the godfather, played by Brando, says, tell me what you want me to do. And he leans over and whispers in Brando's ear, and Brando goes, no. And then he calls in Fat Clemenza, and he says, here's what I want done. And he wants justice, in other words. He's going to do back to the boys what they did to the daughter. So we all love Brando because he's, he was a judicious gangster, right? Now, how many of you listening to this show, in your heart of hearts, don't wish, at, didn't wish at some point in your life, for justice that you could not find in the courts. I mean, don't call the show. That's what I'm talking. Am I right or wrong about that? Oh, absolutely right. That's all. all right. Well, that's the problem. I'll give you another example from Life 101. And I'm going to try and do it in a way that uh, offends nobody in my own family. But they don't listen anyway. So what's the difference? I mean, my immediate family, yes. I'm talking about the family I left behind. Uh, <clears throat> let's put it to you this way. There was once an individual in the family who ripped my mother off for her life savings. And she had respected and loved this man. She looked up to him. She thought he was so charming. And one day she cried to me that he took all of her money on a fake investment. But he was so charming. He would give her shrimp, uh, you know, stuff like that. He'd pay her back with, with petty garbage to keep assuaging her. And she came to me and she told me what he had done. And she told me what she wanted to be done. And I said to her, Mom, listen to me. Seek justice from God, not from me. Well, as things turned around, 
this very individual who hurt her very badly and others in the family wound up in jail for unrelated charges. He died a broken soul, an unknown broken soul. I didn't wish him any harm because I said to myself at the time, this is a case for God, not for me. And I tell you the truth, to a great extent, God sees the truth and maybe he waits too long in some cases. I have seen God's hand in the case of evil. I have seen it over and over in my life. Don't assume that people who are bad always get away with it. And don't assume that people who are good always get hurt. It's just not the way it is. So in that sense, maybe I'm a little naive. Maybe I myself am still a little naive. Uh, and, you know, when you seek immediate uh, justice, that's called vengeance, incidentally. That's what it's called. Immediate justice is called vengeance. Judicious justice is called justice. But that requires prudence. Now, I don't mean to get too preachy, but I know that what I just said is, I think, on a higher level than uh, you might expect from a, um, uh, a radio talk show. But we're talking about justice is what we're talking about, because I feel elated by what just happened. I mean, I suspected the Supreme Court would not hear this, this trivial case. I knew it was being done just to avoid paying me. Now I'm going to have to collect from what? Who am I going to collect from? There's nothing left up there but two Dixie cups and a string. That's all. It's all gone. You know, I'm entitled to all of my archives in the case. All of my radio archives from the year 2000 are in the archives, and I won all of it. That means more to me than anything. Have I seen one of the tapes? No. I want my radio archives. Now, I wouldn't even get that, did I? Did I even get that? Where are they? I think this guy would rather burn them than give them to me. That's the kind of justice there is. So don't tell me that I don't know what justice should be. And don't tell me that I suddenly think it's all wonderful. No, I don't. I'm not a Pollyanna. But nevertheless, we'll see how this goes. Let's hear your cases. That's what I care about. 855-407-282. We just heard a case from the East Coast. I think we should now hear one from the West Coast. KSFO. San Francisco. Steve on KSFO. What's your court case? My court case actually was with the Department of Corporations in the state of California. And on, during a phone conversation, they told me, quote, we're going to, we can't find, they were investigating my company. And they said, we can't find anything wrong, but we're going to force you to franchise because we don't think it's fair. You're so much less than your competition. This was all spawned by my competitor, who's much, much, much larger than us, uh, filing um, things that with different states to investigate us because we sold as a business opportunity. They sold as a franchise, and they. How much did how much did the, how much did this cost you in the court, Steve? Uh, a little over fifty thousand. And well, I, what did did you win in the long run or not? Thousands to franchise. I'm saying, but so in other words, the end you didn't win anything. You lost. Uh, I lost because I chose not to fight. Um, we were already into this thing for so much money that we didn't. Well, you know, Steve, you know and I know that sometimes you got to know when to hold and you got to know when to fold. That's a part of business. That's a part of daily life. Only an idiot would get into a fight with someone who they know can beat them, you know? I mean, you know, we love to see the character in the movies. He gets pounded and he keeps getting up. And the guy hits him and knocks him down. And the guy refuses to quit and he gets up and he gets his teeth knocked out and his broken nose. But in real life, you don't do that. What you do is you get up and walk away if you're being pummeled. Absolutely. That's exactly right. And I'm, I'm talking about reality 101. I'm not talking about a movie. Now, there are guys who will fight until they're dead. I know that. We've read about them. We've seen them. But how few and far between they are, we don't know. But the point is, is that how you want to be in a court of law? No. If, you, if you're going to get pummeled, you know, you walk away and that's it and you fold. Unless you have unlimited time and money. And some people do. I don't. WABC, New York City. Mike, what's your court horror story? Go ahead, please. You're on the Savage Nation. This story kind of reiterates your point about the liberal court of appeals. But back in 2008, I think it was, it was a small-time loan that I, I gave this guy. He didn't want to do it, but he kept begging me. I was like, all right. So it was, I think it was an initial amount of 3000 So I took it to court when he finally didn't pay, which I knew he wouldn't. And uh, I did get the judgment, and then afterwards I turned him over to collector because, as you just said, you know that's getting the the win is only half the battle. And right. the collectors were, did a really great job. Um, but what a lot of people don't realize that in at least in New York, I don't I don't know about the other states, but you have to have a minimum amount of cash in your account before they can levy. So that's another hurdle you got to get over. 
And I think the number is like, unless you have 1700 they can't uh, garnish wages or levy the account. So anyway, time goes on. We're slowly tracing more accounts as this guy's running off. But 